Hi, I'm Lisene Mokwatle, and you're listening to Radio Workshop. The internet can be a harsh place. Think trolls. Those strangers who hide behind their computer screens and go out of their way to blow up a comment thread by being cruel and disruptive. And sometimes abuse that starts online can turn into real-life harassment and cause even more harm. Especially if you live in a small community where there's no such thing as being anonymous. That's why our next story surprised us. Growing up in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa, Noximelane never really felt safe to speak about his gender dysphoria, but when he did, he did it on YouTube. This is our second story about allyship, and this time, the unexpected ally was the internet. When I was young, I'm 24 now, but back when I was young, around seven years old, Childhood me was trying to tell me something. And it's not like I put too much thought into it or anything. But one day, I just decided to pee standing up. As a girl, I was told to sit, obviously. But that day, I wanted to stand. And so I did. I went into the bathroom, locked the door, and I gave it my best shot. 50% of it ran down my legs, some of it went to the toilet, and the rest was on the seat. It was embarrassing. It ended up on my pants, my underwear. It was just a total mess. It's obvious now that childhood me was trying to tell me something, but I guess I was just really too young to connect the dots back then. Things only really fell into place for me at 13. For 13 year old me, YouTube was the beginning of everything. I know I know a lot of people are gonna say, oh no, not another person coming out, but uh, well, it is. <laughs> As a young teen, YouTube opened up my world. I mean, there was Sam Collins, who I watched a lot. As you can already tell by the title, I'm transgender. Um, I'm FTM, transgender, which means female to male, which means that I used to be female, used to live as a female. And I know some people- And I watched all the videos by Benton as well. So this week I thought that we could take another little trip to the past. You know how there's like little things that you did as a kid and just like coincidentally line up with something now? It's like, oh, that's why I do that. So in particular, I mean, I'm talking about things that I did as a little girl that like coincidentally now makes sense that, you know, I was a boy. But it's not like if you do those things, you automatically are. It just happened. I mean, mean, pictures. I was just a black kid from Pinamarasburg, South Africa, watching these videos. I didn't even know being trans was a thing before YouTube. I mean, I'd never spoken to anyone about my feelings before. And something just told me to keep my mouth shut. Like there was something wrong with the feelings I was feeling. But here were these people on the other side of the planet who felt just like me. And they even had a name for those feelings. The name being transgender. And they acted on those feelings. And it turned out okay for them. In fact, it turned out so well that I could count on them to be there every week with the new video, showing them living as their real selves. So I started watching more and more videos. I became obsessed. Then gay, I compared my experience to these constantly. It took me like four years of watching these videos and thinking hard about myself. By the time I was 17, I felt like I was ready to tell my mom. I was away from home and yo, I was nervous, but couldn't wait any longer. So I decided to come out to her via text message. Waiting for her response, it it made me sick to my stomach. Being her only child, I was scared of being a huge disappointment. Like going from daughter, next thing I'm a son, I knew it would be way too much for her to handle. But her response, eh, yeah, ne? she offered to look for trans support groups. I mean, that's amazing. She then told me she'd be with me every step of the way, that I shouldn't feel alone or feel like a burden. And to me, that means a great deal. Knowing I had my mother's permission gave me the confidence to take the next steps to my transition. I started my own YouTube channel two days after because I just could not wait. Also, remember how I spoke about YouTubers Sam Collin and Benson earlier? They cracked open my world. 
but they were white and American. They couldn't really tell me how to go about transitioning in South Africa. And I wondered how much harder it would be for a boy in a relatively small town in KwaZulu Natal. At the time, there weren't many black South African trans YouTubers out there. Information about going on testosterone in South Africa was very hard to come by. And trust me, I googled hard. There was no one out there making this info easy to access. So it just seemed right for me to step up and be that YouTuber for others as I transitioned. When I was a kid, like my cousins and uh, friends used to play house house. If you do not know what house house is, it's where you and your friends play a family where there's a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister and a little baby. And I posted my first video on the 17th of August 2017 and it was my how I knew story. I remember that like I always used to play the male figure, like I'd always want to be the brother or the dad or the time. I'd use like a stick, put it down my pants and use it for the fangs. So once I started on testosterone, I posted videos about my transition. The things I've noticed is that I have hair on my legs, my thighs, my arms, like right here, and on my face as well, I have like little chin hairs. Another thing is my scent, my body odor. It's so strong that at times I have to shower twice a day because it's that strong and I'm just like, wow. And at times my body is just like, mm-mm, mm-mm, my babes, I'm okay, so it's time. My voice as well, at times it's high pitched, at times it's deep, so I, I do not know what's happening. Um, it's annoying, it's very annoying. One of my most popular videos was a step-by-step -step guide on how to transition in South Africa. Next step. Okay, next step is you go see a psychologist. A psychologist that is LGBTI friendly and they are educated about these things and they are away and they know Uti. The Yo, making those videos, cool. I had a lot of emotions. Fear, excitement, sadness. You may wonder why I felt sad. I mean, coming out on YouTube was a big move. Everyone would find out. And I knew they wouldn't all accept me. I would lose a lot of people. Yazi, you'd think the worst would come from haters in the comment section. But the strangers I spoke to on my channel were mostly supportive. It was the people I knew who said the worst things. I get DM'd by friends or family who watch the videos. They'd ask me to explain myself. I even got called a freak at some point. But I kept posting. I was on a mission to become the real me, to see the real me in my videos. Thank you for watching, guys. And again, please do subscribe, please do share, guys. Share. Literally, just share. Especially on Facebook, all you have to do is click. And it's like, share now. And you're like, yes, babes, that is it. But I understand if you have family who is like, what is this? Okay, I understand. Then please share on your WhatsApp, because I'm pretty sure you blocked your family. So please do that. My videos are a kind of mirror for me. I re-watch them from time to time because I like to see how far I've come in my transition. But sometimes I look at myself and I think, I'm not man enough. And it bothers me. It affects my mental health. Honestly, the thing that bothers me the most is that I cannot have a family, like naturally. I won't be able to impregnate the future mother of my kids. These aren't thoughts I like to share on my YouTube channel much. I don't want to seem ungrateful. I guess. I just don't want to be seen as someone who isn't fulfilled. I mean, I use he, him pronouns, I pass. What have I got to complain about, right? But yeah, everything about being trans feels so medical sometimes. I mean, I have to keep taking injections of testosterone and then there's top surgery and bottom surgery. <sighs> Some days, it sucks. I keep turning on that camera because I know my channel is helping a lot of people out there. I'm just here to update you guys on what's like how I've been feeling and what's not what's been happening, but yeah, what's happening. This one time I got a comment that really sticks with me. Let me read it to you. I can't believe I finally found a fellow South African trans man on YouTube. I feel like crying, bro. And here's another one. It's amazing hearing someone with my accent talking about the stuff I think about all day. I wish this community would grow more. Um, yeah, I love you guys. I've never told you guys that, but <laughs> I do. <laughs> I mean, I even got a comment from a trans YouTuber in Jamaica saying, 
keep doing what you're doing. I love the realness, man. Hey, <laughs> it's feedback like that. Yeah, it just makes it all worth it. I really do, man. I appreciate all your comments and all your your messages, everything. Like it literally keeps me going and it gives me the 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 the, the motivation to keep posting and just keep doing the most. So hence why I'm showing face now. Unplanned video. I just like let me just go film, and here I am. Here we are. You can still find Knox on YouTube, although he posts to TikTok more often these days. We asked him if he felt it was still necessary to be on social media to help other queer youth. And he said it's 50-50. Even though things on YouTube have slowed down, he still gets messages from people saying his channel changed their lives. But things are moving quickly. Trans kids younger than him are living more freely. They don't feel the need to explain themselves to the world like he did. Coming out online could have gone much worse for him, but he always knew he was willing to take the hits if it meant he was paving the way for the next generation to live more unapologetically. Here We Are was written and produced by Knox Similane and Joe Jackson, This episode is produced by the Radio Workshop and the Children's Radio Foundation. Joe Jackson is our managing producer. Rob Rosenthal and I edited this podcast. Additional production assistance by Martha O'Donovan and Naomi Gruen. Music by Blue Dot Sessions. Sound engineering by Mike Rayfeld. Our studio technician is Sims Gula. A big thanks to Catherine Grenfell and Audio Militia in Johannesburg, where we record this podcast. This episode and the work of the Radio Workshop would not be possible without support from Steve Hendrickson, Pam and Bill Michael Check, The Other Foundation, and the Theodore J. Forstman Charitable Trust and the Emerging Markets Foundation. Visit our website for more information and to support our work at radioworkshop.org.